G'day champions. Here we have a Panther valve head. This is made in Australia. I couldn't find any info about it anywhere. Uh, literally not even a photo online. Uh, so I think we're going to be reverse engineering this one and uh, writing out the schematic just for future reference for that two amps on the planet that have the same design. <laughs> it's got a pretty nice finish on it. This sort of uh, reeded Tolex stuff tiny little handle um, I wouldn't mind upgrading that handle because it feels like it's going to break every time you pick it up this is the front of the amp it's a uh, solid panel in there with just grill cloth for our cosmetics oh, there's a couple of holes but yeah you're talking like one inch diameter they're not going to do much for ventilation but uh, the controls are on the back so we'll spin it around and show you so you can see here the controls are on the back uh, there's no removable panels here, so all the chassis and everything has to come from the inside forwards uh, after removing that front panel. This is from back in the day when you'd stand behind the amp, the amp would be in front of you on show and you'd, you'd be controlling it from like the rear of the dance floor or whatever. Um, they've got a really nice printed panel, like it almost looks like a silk screen. Um, there seems to be some f faint sort of... Uh, pixelation happening there like maybe it is from a digital era uh, but yeah it's hard to tell it looks like it's original and uh, possibly yeah some kind of silk screen like done in house uh, it's got a pretty sort of sharp contrast uh, the lettering you can see the bottom of that B is infilled a bit so that's what makes me think it was silk screen from the rear and then um, and then spray painted like white on top of that, sort of like plexi style. Uh, you got some labeling here, which was added after the fact. That looks like it's just to remind the owner what order to flick the switches in. You got these toggle switches with these nice uh, big paddles on them, which is kind of cool. I've not seen them before. So essentially, coming from the start, you got lead and rhythm, top boost, pull out. So they're pull pots. Um, you got these aluminium knobs that were like, they almost look homemade, but I, I like them, I reckon they look kind of cool. They might have even made them in-house, this is probably why a lot of these companies went, went down the drain, because they, they refused to do anything outside of the, outside of, uh, their operation. So you've got, uh, yeah, so volume one and two, volume two and three, so that's the inputs, you can see they're numbered there. They've each got a top boost pull out on it which I guess is just a bright cap we'll we'll investigate further you've got a tremolo uh, is that clicky no out on okay in off out on so yeah you pull that and that engages it doesn't appear to be any foot switch anywhere but there might be a socket inside the uh, inside the cabinet we don't know it's got a reverb which curiously has a click to switch on uh, I'm not sure if that's actually in circuit or not but we'll investigate further and then your uh, standby and power switch and your appears to be neon um, indicator so you can see here there's a couple of screws one screw there one screw there so this is a weird shaped chassis um, I've had a quick look up inside it but um yeah I haven't really taken it apart until now but the quotes overdue I'm getting phone calls every other day um, as to whether I've looked at it or not, so we've got to get get this happening. All right, so we've got our mains cord there. It's just one of those replacement ones, no strain relief, so we might be changing that cord out uh, just for safety's sake. Uh, they're not safety plugs, obviously, because they're old school, but I like to change these out with, with molded plugs. They're just a little bit more reliable, and that cord is feeling like a, a uh, snake that's eaten a bunch of uh, smaller snakes, I don't know. <laughs> and this this cable is doing that thing where uh, it's internally sort of like twisting, probably from being rolled up around someone's elbow for decades. The wiring inside twists inside the insulation and can break and short out, so we'll, we'll be replacing that. But over this side, there's a... Uh, a cord that just disappears into the chassis with a with a jack on the end of it. So maybe that is like the reverb or uh, tremolo foot switch. 
I don't know. We'll dig deeper. So we've got a curious combination of flathead and uh, Phillips screws. And they appear to be original. It was just sort of like in that crossover period where everything was going Phillips and the flathead screws were becoming obsolete-ish. you just got to be really careful undoing them. Get the right size screwdriver and don't slip. Don't use a drill. Never use a drill on flathead screws. You'll, you'll just go wandering across the Tolex leaving a trail of destruction. So I've got my flat pallet knife here. I like to just get that in and just gently persuade things. There's literally like not even a spare millimetre there. Alright, we're at the business end. I'll just lay this flat and then we'll uh, we'll have a look at the valve configuration at least from the rear. Alright, so here's the configuration. We've got a two-piece chassis, sort of almost like reminiscent of a Vox. Uh, and it's got the power section on the, the bottom one and you've got the preamp on the top and you can see here they've actually <laughs> they've brazed together or soldered together to the two chassis that was their means of connecting them I guess the uh, screws do the rest the very few screws there are you can see here there's uh, just like a little self tapper there drilled at an angle for some odd reason so we've got someone's written in text to here. I don't know if that's from the original production or a repair person at some point. Got a 12AX7, I'm assuming a phase inverter there, and then you got uh, two 6L6GCs. You've got it says V V2 Mullard 461. I don't know. It looks like an EZ81 to me. EZ81. Uh, you've got two ANR transformers uh, there. That's the output. That's the power transformer up with their beautiful uh, hammer tone finish on them. Manufactured in Melbourne. Back in the day. And that's the type, a 2653. I think there's some, uh, not data sheets, but there's some spreadsheets floating around or like old price lists that have uh, a table with their impedances and stuff on them. So up the front, mounted sideways. Two 12AX7s apparently, reportedly. One 6AV6, so that's half a 12AX7 in a single package essentially. 6HV6. Focus. A 6B dash dash, so yeah, that makes me think it's a repair person because the writing's probably uh, probably uh, come off the thing. Oh my god, Panasonic, for fuck's sake, focus you stupid fuck. And over here you got V1, 6B, something, something. So yeah, I reckon the uh, writings come off it and uh, they've gotten only the 6B off the valve. But I'd say that's probably the uh, reverb driver and recovery, a 6BM8, uh, which is uh, off the top of my head, a triode and a pentode combined in the one package. So you can use the pentode to drive the reverb tank and the triode for the recovery stage. But of course all this is guesswork, so uh, until we take it apart and actually trace the circuit out and figure out exactly what they're doing, uh, it's all just hearsay. So let's open her up. You got some attempt at strain relief here, which is uh, probably adequate, but um, what you find is with these cheap chipboard uh, cabinets, all the screws are reamed out, so you've either got to find a new hole or plug that one and re-drill it. There's another little clamp there, which maybe was... Uh, Maybe that's that other cable because it's you can see it disappearing down there. That was some attempt at strain relieving that cable uh, But yeah, it's those things don't work very well. They don't hold on You see them in old houses where they used to use them to secure the mains wiring within the wall quite a bit but Yeah, they've gone the way of the dodo and under there you've got the uh, the world's longest handle screws So they'll have to come out in order to slide that chassis forwards uh, I think we're only going to get so far because we've got these blocks here preventing us from um, just sliding the thing straight out. This chassis down the bottom is narrow enough to fit between them but the one at the back is not. So it's going to be a matter of we'll see if we can um, get it out to a certain point and then get enough angle on it to fit between them. But yeah, it's going to be it's going to be fun to remove if I can tell that just looking at it. <laughs> You can see here the rivet has snapped off there. 
this is really crappy. This needs to be sorted. Um, you've got this big chunky transformer that like not even a self-tapping screw normally can secure without bending stuff and distorting. And they've they've gone with a washer with a rivet through it <laughs> instead of a screw. And of course the the washers uh, disappeared long ago, and the top of the rivet's no longer riveted. So. Uh, Surprisingly, the others are still holding on, but I think we'll be replacing them with screws because that's pretty pretty shoddy, even at the best of times. Finally, a Phillips screw, just for a change. Lucky Phillip. I'm just going to remove the handle to... Uh, be able to slide anything out because those screws were way long and they were protruding down within the cabinet, preventing us from removing the chassis. All right, we have movement. So watching everything as we go. See if we can get enough angle. I think the controls are starting to hit at the front there. Oh, there's a reverb tank. <laughs> Just fit over those blocks. We can adjust. Everything's within a millimeter of working or not working. All right, we're free. I'm free. Just feed those cables through. That wasn't very graceful, but I think that's about. <laughs> As good as we can hope for. So here's this monstrosity. I think it's safe to say they were taking more than a few cues from Vox. Uh, and yeah, I was mistaken about that plug. That's actually the speaker outlet. I thought I saw a socket in there earlier, but I was mistaken. So that's uh, that's the speaker outlet there. You've got your output stage here. Looks pretty crowded, but uh, you know, he's pretty easy to follow. It's your phase inverter there. Uh, you've got a bunch of uh, axial caps which we'll have to replace with something. So we'll go through all the values, just get a get a bunch of notes together and measure whatever we can uh, passively and see what's drifted, if anything, and uh, go from there in the power section. The soldering and everything looks pretty good. Uh, so... It's been treated rather well by the looks of it. There's a few tack solder joints and stuff which are a bit questionable, but you know, it's lasted this long. You got Jucon caps everywhere made in Australia. Even got Australian made uh, resistors there. <laughs> See that? 10K. So yeah, that's the output section. Here's the main power supply, there's the speaker connections, uh, so let's flip over and have a look at the preamp end. So here's the reverb unit, <clears throat> it looks pretty similar to a, like an Accutronics or Belton or whatever, just the dimensions are a bit different, the drilling's different, the plating's different, the metal's a different thickness, it just looks different, and uh, you can see here they've, they've just like tin snipped off um, that wing and uh, mounted it against the chassis and they've um, curiously instead of just screwing something they've got the holes there to do it they've uh, brazed a bracket to the end and then just screwed that with a self tapper brass screw by the looks of it so yeah interesting <laughs> down here you can see uh, instead of using an RCA connector they just ran the wires straight through the hole and soldered it internally and as well as to the chassis same goes over here but yeah you find all sorts of, it looks like some kind of uh, acid flux was used there you find all sorts of weird stuff like this on Australian amps they just had a different way of thinking and they just wanted to get the job done and probably go to the pub and get on the piss being Australians so reverberation unit made by Gibbs Manufacturing Research Manufacturing and Research Corporation Janesville, Wisconsin, subsidiary of Hammond Organ Company. Oh, well, there you go, associated with Hammond. So it's probably similar to a Hammond reverb tank, not that I've seen any. 
So going from our input end there, we've got our four jacks going straight down to the board there. Relatively short lines, everything looks nice and neat. You've got similar tag strips that you find in the old boxes. They just don't have that J end on them, they're just a full eyelet, which in my opinion is a lot easier to work with. All the solder connections are just tacked, like that. The leads actually look like they pass through, but all the wires, they're, they're often just tacked to a bulb of solder, so... You know, that's not the best way of doing it, but it's lasted this long. Here's our pull pots for various uh, purposes. You've got little um, mylar caps down there. Film caps, probably X-Radio stuff. Looks like a bit of solid core wire for most of it. Uh, and then our power switch is over here. I don't think that's mains rated cable. Uh, but hey, it's inside a chassis. And there's our valve sockets. We've got a choke down there. Choke? No. That's our reverb send. So it is a uh, transformer driven reverb. Uh, you got a little box down there which looks curiously shinier than the rest of everything. Like it's either a different plating or it was put in after market, I doubt it, but... Uh, and we've got some bus wire going across. So uh, that's our just brief look at the thing. So uh, I'll start taking some measurements. I've already spied down here with my little eye. You can see here on the end of that cap that end plug is about to fly off. Uh, so that that cap's dead. Uh, this is a constant battle against misinformation out there uh, that you should test all these old caps and make sure that they're fine. Um, they're designed to last like 10 years, maybe 20 years if it's in a very favorable environment and they're very long life caps, but they're not designed to last indefinitely, honestly. Uh, you can see down there in that one if we can get it to focus there is a bulge there as well in that end cap I don't think it's gone short circuit but uh, I'll pull up the job sheet and their reported fault and if there's massive amounts of hum chances are one of them's open uh, so people go on about reforming caps reforming a cap is a process of exposing it to a slowly ramping voltage uh, current controlled over a long time so basically it's like they it's like they're trying to remind a cap to be a cap and in some people's mind that makes sense and that sometimes it does have an effect but it's temporary at best because reforming a cap, a cap doesn't magically refresh the electrolyte that's in it chemically um it doesn't make it wet again uh so <laughs> that's the main reason these caps fail because they dry out and they stop being capacitors they just start being two plates near each other with a microscopic capacitance compared to what their original tolerances were. So just replace them, champions. Uh, we want this thing to sound like it was when it was new, not sound like a decrepit old piece of shit. That's my job. Well, that's interesting. Uh, on this reverb tank, they've got cloth-covered wire feeding the coils. That's probably one situation where cloth-covered wire really has an advantage there because uh, it's less likely to cut through from that little saddle up you can see up in there. A very common fault on these is that uh, that saddle cuts through the cable as it's bouncing around and uh, you lose signal and you can just reconnect that cable, repair that wire. What the real problem with these uh, reverb tanks is, well not this particular one, but um, a common problem is the coil goes open circuit uh, often where it's soldered to the little stakes uh, that, that the more modern tanks have they use connectors and the wire wraps around some little headers and um, solders to it so the solder, whatever the solder they use um, it, it doesn't protect the solder joint from moisture and the moisture eats through the copper wire that makes up the coil and there's not enough wire to access that header and you can't repair it you can't do anything with it you can't replace that coil it looks like you could just pop that coil off but it's held captive by those laminations there so you'd have to pull them out delaminate it but you've got the rivet going through them as well as these 
uh, springs and their magnets so it's really disassembly is not an option so the tanks are considered a replaceable part these days uh, whereas this one's probably fine so looking at the caps we've got on the left there Nito what is it Ch Chiku Denki which is now Nito Denko Corporation which is a Japanese corporation based out of Tokyo and then you've got the now defunct uh, Jukon caps god almost escaped me there made in australia back in the day we used to make capacitors believe it or not so you find them in all sorts of um australian stuff old radios and whatnot they were a very big brand at the time and i think a lot of that had to do with military supply as it often does so just having a quick look at the uh the dropper resistors up there you can tell they're dropper because they're going from filter stage to filter stage they're droppers and just they are part of the low pass filter that makes up each stage of the power supply. None of them appear to be burnt, so that's a that's a win. Uh, what often happens is these caps go open circuit rather than short circuit. I've only ever seen a shorted cap, well, not many times. Like probably, uh, if a, if a cap's failed, maybe one out of twenty times it's short gone short circuit as opposed to. Uh, to open circuit or just just losing capacitance uh, that's that applies only to electrolytics though uh, film caps and um, t particularly tantalums and often ceramics tend to fail short circuit so just a quick uh, cursory examination of the output stage we can see we've got the pin there uh, the locating key at the top there on each socket and we've got the pin 8 and pin 1 connected so that's the suppressor grid and the cathode on each of the output valves there so we've got a 270 ohm 3 watt resistor from cathode to ground so that's our cathode resistor there that's shared between the two valves you've got a wire linking them up over here then we've got a 25 microfarad 25 volts bypass cap over here so they're separated apart but it's essentially a bypassed uh, cathode biased output stage and a quick look at the phase inverter we appear to have a long tail pair configuration the, some of the wires like you barely touch them and they're um, some of the component leads you barely touch them and they're touching other stuff so we'll, we'll just space everything out a little bit better there's many places where um, they're almost touching and you just touch them and they they make contact <laughs> But uh, again, no sort of evidence of burns or anything in this area, so that's promising. Uh, we'll check all of these. These are all carbon comp resistors, so we'll check them all for drift because anything under significant load there um, probably probably has drifted up in value. You've got a couple of carbon films here. I'm not sure who made them, but you see them in all this, this age stuff as well. Uh, but overall, it's all looking like uh, a lot of the infrastructure is still intact and everything's probably going to be fine but we'll, we'll fire it up once we've done the essentials and we'll we'll fine tune from there what you've often got to do with these things is just get them functional get them to the point where you can trust them to fire them up uh, even at reduced voltage current limited whatever but um, just get rid of the stuff that you know you're gonna to have to replace and then fine tune it from there actually run some signal play through the thing and uh, and then you get down to the nitty gritty and it just becomes a, um, a process of uh, just solving the biggest problem first and then solving all the niggly problems afterwards. Oh, so looking a bit closer, this uh, little box down there, that's a potted little secret, secret squirrel box. So even back in the day, people were trying to hide their trade secret, secrets and proprietary fucking bullshit. So you've got the base and treble cap up there and you've got the tremolo depth cap, I believe. And uh, they've got some connections there as well as the ground bus. So I'm wondering if that's just maybe the tone stack uh, caps and stuff in there. But yeah, without tracing the whole thing out, we won't really know. And then we still kind of won't really know what's inside the box. And if there's anything that's failed in the box, we can't really do much about it other than reverse engineer what we think it is and, and recreate it somehow. Uh, or depot that thing so it just slows you down and it costs the customer money I mean there's no skin off my nose but um, at the end of the day the customer is the one that ends up paying for this kind of proprietary bullshit 
and I'm, I'm just surprised that it's in something of this age because uh, back then guys tended to be a little bit more honest about their position in the world as uh, as engineers rather than thinking they're changing the world with a tone stack circuit <laughs> so just another look at the top uh, now we can actually see what's going on a bit better just remove those shields they're just sort of press fit ones so working our way from v1 we've got a mullard made in australia so that's what i was thinking was the 6bm8 and looking at the construction i reckon yeah that's likely what it is we'll see if we can read anything on it we'll grab it from the very tip so we don't rub off any writing 6b yeah so the writing's been completely erased there but i reckon that's a 6bm8 i think i've got one of them floating around if that's got any issues they're not cheap mind you 6av6 so i was talking about this before this is this is basically half of a 12ax7 it's a single triode it's made in Australia as well. Uh, they're handy when you need an odd odd amount of triodes, but of course these days with things like the Blues, what is it, Blues Junior, Blues Deluxe, they had an unused triode, so they just they just ground all the pins and just use half of a 12AX7. Here's another one there, another Mullard, 6AV6. And we've got two 12AX7s. Again, the riding's pretty rubbed off here. I think a few people have had a go at this. 12x7 Mits uh, Matsushita, so Japanese valve. The legs are all really corroded, which can give you all sorts of crackling and and horrible behaviour. So that's another thing, another reason for replacing them. Yeah, Matsushita Electric Industry Co Limited. So that's another Japanese one. Um, Sometimes you just have to replace the valves because the legs are too corroded and you can't really clean them up It's it gets this rock hard sort of coating on the outside of them and If you clean them off, they're just going to corrode even quicker because they don't have any plating on them at all then if you use something abrasive so onto the 6L6s the Getters appear to be in good shape. These are probably fine if uh, they are we'll reuse them So these are mini watt made in the USA. Now Mini Watt uh, existed, I don't know the history that well, but they I know they existed in Australia to some degree as well because you do see Mini Watt on stuff and made in Australia on the label as well. I should do a bit more history in that, but you know, let's, let's deal with the thing that's about to kill us instead of the history. <laughs> and you've got a little mullard down there, a the little rectifier, it almost looks undersized for an amp of this calibre. And uh, you've got some text, uh, text are written, the valve designation there, and then the Mullard 461 written with what looks like Biro. So I don't know if that's the owner or another tech. I personally, I am not a fan of writing on a chassis. Uh, I'd want to just, that's what notebooks are for. And um, hey, it'd probably help us out in this, this case, but there's a degree of... Um, well, you've got to be, you can't take uh, for granted what's written on the chassis because you don't know the skill level or the, I mean, right there, they, they didn't know what that valve was. So are these the right valves or was it just what was in there when they uh, when they took them out last time they looked at it? You know, like someone could have put the wrong valve in there and old mate's just written, oh, that's a 12AX7 when really it's a 12AT7. It won't be in this case, but... You don't know. I mean, maybe that phase inverter was supposed to be something different. So you've got to you've got to be very skeptical when you see handwritten stuff on a chassis because they they're just writing what's in front of their face often, and it may or may not be correct. Now the fact that this has V1 and V2 written here, that makes me think that maybe there is a schematic floating around somewhere because generally the input valves, these two here, and you can tell they're inputs because a they're at the input end. And B, they were they had sh uh, shields on them. Normally, they'd be like V1 and V2, right? Because it's starting from the start. But maybe this reverb circuit was from another amp, uh, and that was the first building block they started designing the schematic around because it already existed. So they just called that V1 because it was the first part they worked on. 
you don't know, but having V1 and V2 there, to me, you wouldn't have written that unless you were referring to some document, and that document is more than likely a schematic. So I might keep hunting for that schematic. Uh, it might save us a bit of work, because tracing these things out from scratch, writing them all down, drawing it, double checking, it takes like hours. So with these old amps, I get a bit of heat for how long it takes, but you've got to remember, like, there's quite a few amps here, champions. I, I've got some work to do, you know, in guitars. So when you've got an amp that takes two or three hours, just three or four hours, just to trace out before you can even figure out what you're looking at uh, and have a documentation or have some documentation of what the circuit is, um, that's hours you can't really charge for. So you're kind of getting my time for free there. Uh, it's, yeah, it's, it's the reason why a lot of people sometimes don't work on these these old unknown amps because that time, uh, people don't appreciate it, essentially. I would have liked to see some grommets on all the uh, the drills. Like That's pretty sharp on that edge. So I think I'll, I'll be popping a grommet on there. It's not under tension, it's not under strain, it's just going from board to board, but um, yeah, that'll set my mind at ease. They've got them around the, the main looms and stuff, which is good, good to see, but I think I'll put them on everywhere where a cable passes through the chassis. And you can see here even the uh, pots are made in Australia, Ducon branded. They're the switched ones, I'm assuming the other ones are the same brand, but... Without looking at the side, we probably can't see. All right, so that inspection combined with some measurements I did off camera, I think I've got enough to go off for the estimate on this one. We'll, uh, we'll factor in some extra margin in case we've got some valves to replace, but uh, we'll have a ballpark co uh, cost for the customer. And I'll just make it clear that there will be some uh, extra fine tuning likely after the initial repair is done. And if there's any more issues, we'll iron them out before he gets it back. And hopefully you'll be happy with that. So keep an eye out for the next episode where we get our hands dirty and we actually get into some work on this thing. Until then, legends.